The Psychology of Money is the best-rated and best-selling personal finance book over the past decade. And, to your surprise, there isn't a single bit of strategic investment advice. There is no need to understand any formula for stock pricing, suggested portfolio balances, or tax efficiency. Instead, as the title indicates, Morgan concentrates on the soft talents of wealth creation. Here are the top 10 key lessons from the book that will significantly boost your capacity to build wealth. 1. Luck and risk. Nothing is as great or terrible as it appears to be. Bill Gates attended one of the world's only computer-equipped high schools. Microsoft co-founder Paul Allen attended Lakeside High School as well. And then there's Kent Evans. Kent was the brightest of the three and possessed an entrepreneurial spirit that Paul and Bill lacked. We are a single player in a game with 7 billion other players. Risk and luck are twins. Every year, one in a million high school pupils perishes on a mountain. One of them was Kent. He never finished high school. When we are successful, we credit our abilities. Bill and the other 300 Lakeside students have a huge advantage over the other 303 million pupils. It is not realistic for 100% of our activities to determine 100% of our destiny. The unforeseen consequences of activities beyond our control are frequently more significant than our direct efforts. The socio-economic position of a child's parents is the strongest predictor of their economic success. In truth, we are all influenced equally by the same amount of luck and skill. According to studies, wealth among brothers is considerably more associated than height or weight. 2. Never enough, when wealthy people do insane things. Kurt Vonnegut informs his friend, Joseph Heller, during a billionaire's party on Shelter Island, that their host, a hedge fund manager, had made more money in a single day than Heller had earned from his phenomenally successful novel Catch-22 throughout its entire lifetime. Yes, Heller says, but I have something he'll never have, enough. Bernie Madoff is the world's most notorious con man, but what most people are unaware of is that before he conned people out of $65 billion. His company made between $25 and $50 million in profit every year. Bernie was enormously and legally wealthy, controlling one of the most lucrative privately held firms in America. He enjoyed more wealth, freedom, and power than most people can possibly imagine. Nonetheless, he tossed it all away since it was inadequate. There is no reason to jeopardize what you have and need in exchange for what you don't have and don't need. Few of us will ever have such wealth. However, most of us will make enough money at some time in our lives to cover all reasonable needs and frequently a lot of what we want. Getting the goalposts to stop shifting is the most difficult financial skill. If we are continuously looking for more, we will never have enough. Having more won't satisfy us. And, like in Bernie's case, striving for more might lead to the loss of everything. 3. Getting wealthy versus staying wealthy. Making smart judgments is not always necessary for good investing. It's about consistently not screwing up. There are several ways to become wealthy, but only one way to remain wealthier. Pragmatism combined with fear. If I were, to sum up, a financial achievement in one word, it would be, survival. As Warren Buffett puts it, the first rule of making money is to avoid losing money. Many individuals earn a lot of money, but far fewer keep it. Making money is a very different skill from keeping money. You get money by taking a chance. You preserve it by being afraid of losing it. That necessitates humility. It is necessary to understand that at least a portion of your achievement is due to luck, so early success does not guarantee future success. To reap the benefits of compounding outcomes, you must remain in business, invest, and play the game. The length of time Warren Buffett has been playing the game accounts for the majority of his success. Many of us seek large profits just to lose everything. Instead, patience and earning average returns over long periods of time build generational wealth. The challenge is to balance short-term fear that you will lose everything on any one day with long-term confidence that the longer you play, the more likely you will achieve spectacular outcomes. Staying wealthy is perhaps more difficult than being wealthy. 4. Freedom 
controlling your time yields the biggest return on investment. The capacity to wake up and say, I can do whatever I want today, is the ultimate form of prosperity. People aspire to get wealthy in order to be happier. But happiness is a difficult topic to discuss because we are all unique. Control, on the other hand, is a universal component of happiness. Humans aspire to be in charge of their own fate. The opportunity to do what you want, when you want, with whoever you want, and for as long as you want is invaluable. It is the highest reward available. According to Angus Campbell's 1981 book The American Sense of Well-Being, having a strong sense of control over one's life is a more reliable predictor of good emotions of well-being than any of the objective life factors we've evaluated. The greatest value of money is its power to give you control over your time. Self-actualization is at the top of Maslow's hierarchy of wants. In such a situation, autonomy may be at the top of the money pyramid. Morgan supports this idea with a tale about interning as an investment banker. He enjoyed the work and worked hard, but he realized that doing something you appreciate on a timetable you can't control might feel the same as doing something you despise. 5. Man in the car paradox Nobody is as taken with your belongings as you are. You seldom say to yourself, wow, the person driving that automobile is cool, when you see someone driving a good car. Instead, you think, wow, people would think I'm awesome if I owned that automobile. This is how individuals think, whether they are conscious or not. There is a paradox here. Individuals seek riches to show others that they should like and appreciate them. However, those other individuals frequently avoid adoring you, not because they do not believe riches are wonderful, but because they use your wealth as a barometer for their desire to be liked and appreciated. Morgan explained it another way in a letter to his newborn son. You may believe that you desire an expensive car, a fine watch, and a large house. But I assure you that you do not. You desire other people's respect and adoration, and you believe that possessing costly things would get you it. It nearly never happens, especially when it comes from individuals you want to be respected and appreciated. The lesson here is to continue pursuing money, or even flashy automobiles. Both appeal to me. It's a subtle acknowledgement that most people want to be respected and appreciated by others, and spending money on nice things may bring you less of it than you think. If you want to get respect and adoration, be careful how you go about it. Humility, compassion, and empathy will earn you far more respect than horsepower. 6. Save money. One of the only things that matters is produced by the one variable you have control over. How fantastic! People divide into three categories after their income reaches a particular level. Those who save, those who don't believe they can save, and those who don't believe they need to save. For the last two, use this. Building wealth is largely dependent on your savings rate and has nothing to do with your income or investment performance. If you view building wealth as something that will require more money or big investment returns, you may become as pessimistic as the energy doomers were in the 1970s. And since you can build wealth without a high income but have no chance of building wealth without a high savings rate, it's clear which one matters more. What's more, the value of riches depends on what you require. Once your money reaches a certain point, all you need is what lies beneath your ego. 7. Rational or reasonable Instead of being coldly rational, try to be mainly reasonable. Just try to be reasonable, please. Reasonable goals are more achievable and likely to be sustained over time since they are reasonable. The goal of academic finance is to identify mathematically sound investing methods. According to Morgan's theory, humans do not always prefer the mathematically ideal course of action. They seek a plan that will optimize their capacity for sleep. According to Morgan, making reasonable decisions as opposed to always being logical results in better long-term investing outcomes. He contends that having no feelings about your approach or the stocks you buy increases the likelihood that you would 
should give up on them when things get tough. What appears to be reasonable thinking turns into a disadvantage. The sane investors who are passionate about their technically flawed trading tactics have an advantage since they are more likely to remain with them. Few financial factors have a stronger correlation with performance than sticking with a plan during difficult times, both in terms of the level of performance and the likelihood of achieving it over time. Take a look at these stats to back up that claim. The historical chances of profiting from trading on American markets have been 50-50 over one-day intervals, 68% over one-year intervals, 88% over 10-year intervals, and, so far, 100% over 20-year intervals. 8. Surprise Ironically, history is the study of change that serves as a road map for the future. Things that have never happened before happen all the time. Stanford professor Scott Sagan famously stated, is a quote that every person who follows the economy or financial markets should place on their wall. The majority of history is the study of unexpected events. However, economists and investors frequently consider it as an unflinching indicator of the future. Recognize the irony. The historians as prophets. Misconception refers to an over-reliance on historical data as a guide to future circumstances in a field where innovation and change are essential to advancement. Knowing what will happen next does not necessarily entail having experienced certain events. In actuality, it rarely does since overconfidence is more a product of experience than it is of forecasting skill. Investments are not an exact science. Even smart people become anxious, greedy, and paranoid because of the enormous number of people making flawed decisions about issues that will have a significant influence on their well-being while having little access to knowledge. Imagine how much more difficult physics would be if electrons had feelings, the renowned physicist Richard Feynman famously said. The tales people create about themselves and their preferences for goods and services are the most significant drivers of anything related to money. They don't frequently remain motionless. With each new generation and culture, they alter. They have changed and will continue to change. When you rely too much on investment history to predict what will happen next, two risky things occur. 1. You'll probably overlook the exceptional occurrences that have the greatest impact. 2. Because history doesn't take into account structural changes that are pertinent to the modern world, it might be a deceptive indicator of the economy's and stock market's future. A crucial distinction, the further back in time you investigate, the more broad-based your conclusions should be. 9. Room for error planning on your plan, not having everything go according to plan, is the most crucial aspect of any strategy. There are numerous examples of wonderful ideas that were carried too far and became bad ideas throughout history. Recognizing that unknowns, like uncertainty, chance, and unpredictability are constant parts of existence is the wisdom in allowing for error. The only way to handle them is to widen the space between what you anticipate happening and what actually could, while preserving your ability to fight another day. Benjamin Graham is credited with developing the idea of margin of safety. He wrote extensively and mathematically about it. The aim of the margin of safety is to render the forecast superfluous, is Morgan's go-to statement of his theory. The only practical method for navigating safely in a world where probabilities, not certainties, control everything is the margin of safety, often known as room for error or redundancy. It is challenging to forecast accurately. The card counter can see this right away because nobody could possibly know where a certain card is located in a shuffled deck. It's less evident to someone who is pondering questions like, when will I be able to retire, or what will the stock market's average yearly return over the next 10 years be? However, they are fundamentally equivalent. We can only do our best to consider the probabilities. People underestimate the requirement for error-free margin in practically every financial decision they make. When analyzing other people's home renovation plans, Harvard psychologist Max Bazerman once found that most people predict the project will cost between 25% and 50% more than expected. However, they projected that renovations would be finished within the allocated time and budget for their projects. 10. Nothing's free 
Although not all costs are disclosed on labels, everything has a cost. Everything has a cost. And the secret to accomplishing many financial goals is simply knowing what the cost is and being prepared to pay it. The issue is that many products costs are not readily apparent before you use them. You'll hear, hold stocks for the long term. It's wise counsel. But do you realize how challenging it is to keep a long term perspective while equities are plummeting? Successful investing comes at a cost like everything else that is important, but it does not use dollars and cents as currency. Volatility, dread, doubt, uncertainty, and regret are some of its characteristics, all of which are simple to ignore until you have to deal with them in the present. You can pay this amount and tolerate turbulence and upheaval in exchange for a good car, or you can locate an asset, comparable to a used automobile, with less risk and a lesser payoff. Alternatively, you might try the Grand Theft Auto style game, try to maximize return while minimizing associated volatility. The third choice is one that a lot of investors select. Though well-intentioned and law-abiding, they develop tactics and strategies to receive the return without paying the price, much like a car thief. They go in and out trading. They try to acquire before the following boom and sell before the following downturn. However, people who seek a prize without paying the price are not regarded favorably by the money gods. Some auto thieves will escape punishment. Many more are apprehended and